Lord, this morning we come before you and we ask you to take your word and to use it to speak truth into our lives. We need to hear from you. Lord, I pray that these words that are spoken this morning would not be received as though they are coming from flesh. May we receive them from the place which revealed them to us. May we understand that they come from the living God. And may we respond with obedient hearts that simply say, Lord, may thy will be done. Lord, I ask you to use this lump of clay that you saved from the mire and the muck of sin. May you use me this morning to do your will and your bidding. Make the words that are said clear. May you use them and make them useful to all who hear. So, Lord, this morning what we ask is that your will would be done and that you would be glorified. So speak to us now through your word, we pray, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you a question. I know I start off with questions often. But this one I want you to really think about. What comes to your mind when someone in the church begins to talk to you about money? Don't we often begin by thinking something like, you know, Pastor, you can teach me an awful lot of things, but when it comes to money, keep your hands off my wallet. (laughs) When we respond that way, I want you to think about this for a second. We are actually ignoring a large part of what the scriptures actually say. Depending upon your source or whichever theologian you respect the most, many of them will teach, many of them will say that there are actually over 500 different passages of scripture. Some say up to 800 different passages that deal specifically with this subject. You know, if God has given us that much information, that much truth, if you will, about a specific subject that he wants us to know about, if he's given us that much, you know, it's probably worth our time to occasionally pause, study, to receive from the Holy Spirit, to take a few minutes to look at it, to see what he has said about the issue. Wouldn't you agree? Here at the International Church, we try to spend a lot of time focusing on the many ways we need to be growing to be like Jesus, to be like Christ every day. So in our connect groups and in other groups, we we take time to focus upon receiving from the Scripture so that we can grow in knowledge of what the Scriptures say. But we don't stop there, do we? We seek then to apply it to our lives. We, We seek to use it to become good spouses and good parents, good neighbors, employees, good citizens within the culture in which we live. As we seek to apply the lessons of Scripture, we find that it applies to every single area of our lives, including our finances. Through the years, as many have passed through the doors of this church, assumptions have been made simply because we don't talk about money here very much, do we? We just don't. Thus, some have even assumed that the church, as a result must not have any needs at all. One person actually said this to me, and I'm I'm going to try to quote it the best that I can. I've attended this church for some time, believing that the church must have all the resources that it will ever, ever need, because the church never talks about money, ever. So for anybody who might be under that impression today, let me just clear it up once and for all. Let me be absolutely clear so there is no mistaking about it. The church does have some needs. We have to pay for the utilities. We have to keep the lights on in the building. We have to pay our taxes. There's property taxes that come with this building. And and we have to pay the salaries of the staff. But most importantly, I think every single person in leadership would tell you this. I know I would, and I think you would agree with the fact. Most importantly, 
We want to be investing the resources that God blesses us with deeply, heavily into the work of the kingdom of God to be a blessing to other people. That's what we want to be doing. Now, on the other hand, let me be really clear. One thing we do not want to be mistaken as this morning is we do not be, want to be misunderstood as just simply being greedy, as simply just wanting money for the sake of money. No, we want to be a blessing to other people. Therefore, let's, this morning, as we study this, for just a few moments, let's try to take this particular church out of the picture for a second. Let's not make this about the international church. Instead, let's make it about what God has said. Thus saith the Lord, what he has said in his word, and maybe, just maybe, if we do that this morning, maybe each one of us will find something in his word that will actually be helpful to each one of us. And what seems like maybe a past life for me, I know that's not possible, but what seems like that. There was a time many years ago after I had finished my formal education where I worked for a period of time in what's called the financial services arena. I worked there for three years. Simply put, I tried to help people invest their hard-earned money into the marketplace to receive a return on their money. During that time, I learned some valuable lessons about investing. First, when you invest your money into something, you should invest it and forget it. Money only multiplies over years of time. It doesn't happen overnight. Next, it's always best not to borrow, but instead spend only what you have. Don't spend what you don't have. Why? Because the borrower almost always ends up becoming the servant of the lender. Finally, never seek to get rich quick. If somebody tells you that it's possible to do that, most likely, friends, it's it's far too good to be true. Thus, invest wisely for the long term. Those with the long-term perspective, those who are looking towards the future with the long-term perspective, are typically those who end up doing best in life. These principles at that time when I worked in that arena, they served me well. And in a few moments, I think you're going to see, as we take a look at these passages in the book of Matthew, words which Christ shared with the multitude when he gave what was called the Sermon on the Mountain, We're going to see that these same principles are going to help us in some ways in regard to honoring Christ with the resources that he's blessed us with, with the monies that he's given us. So as we get started, let's do so this morning by asking a really simple question. The question I want us to ask this morning is, what does Jesus have to say about how we should then be investing the resources he's given us? How should we be investing our money, the resources he's blessed us with, well, in that <clears throat> forgive me. In that passage, I think you're going to see three principles. The first is really simple. Choose wisely where you invest. Choose wisely where you invest. Let's begin, if you will, and join me by looking at Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 21. There Jesus said to those that he was speaking to that day, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Many years ago, before Jim Elliott, the missionary who tragically was killed along the shores of a remote river in Ecuador many years ago, many years ago before his life was actually sacrificed there, he said the following, he is no fool to give what he cannot keep to gain what he could never lose. In this passage, I believe Christ is teaching a very similar principle. He was saying that if we invest our treasures in eternity, we can't lose them. They'll never be lost. On the other hand, if we invest 
the things that are of this world, the things that we treasure in this world, if we only invest in those things, friends, they will eventually be lost forever. You cannot hold on to those things. Nothing in this world was meant to last forever. Moth, as the passage says, rust, as the passage says, might have suggest time. All of these things, every single one, they will eventually have their way. All things will deteriorate. They will be destroyed. They will go away. Additionally, there's not an investment, if you will, that cannot be manipulated by a dishonest broker. An opportunity where a safe, if it's left unattended, cannot be cracked. Nor a thief that will not take advantage of you if you give him opportunity. It's really obvious You don't have to look very far to see that there is not a place in this world that is 100% safe. A place where the things that we treasure most are completely secure. Christ made this clear in a parable that he once told. It's found in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21. He said, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll I'll tear down my barns and I will build up new ones. And there I will store all my surplus grain. I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Then Jesus drew it all together. He summarized it with these words. This is how it will be with whoever stores up for themselves things here on earth but is not rich towards God. When we handle the resources that God has blessed us with, like this rich man handled his, we can truly expect a very similar Result. This man, he tried to hold on to all that he had. He tried to hold on to it, but he couldn't, could he? Because in the end, what happened? He lost it all. He lost everything. Thus, there must be. There must be a different way. There must be a different path that we can each take in our lives that will lead to a better outcome. What is that path? What is that way? As the Apostle Paul ended or came to the end of his life, as he neared the end of it, he wrote a series of letters to his protege, Timothy. In one of them, we find advice that will really help us this morning answer that question. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. Paul there says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is, notice, so uncertain. But what? Instead, to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the age to come. Simply put, when we invest in Christ's kingdom, we are putting our treasure, notice this, think about it this way, you're putting your treasure in a savings account that is eternal, an account that cannot be raided, can never be lost. Yes, God, he he might bless you now. He might bless you in this life. But whether he chooses to do that or not, we don't know what his will is in this life. But whether he chooses to do that or not, it has no bearing upon the security of the investment that I make in eternity. It has no bearing upon it at all. You see, the reason for that is simple. God's promises, they are immutable. I know that's a big theological term. It simply means they don't change. They can never be changed. When God says it, he does it. What he says, he does. So if we're not sure what God's going to do, we can trust the fact. We can know for sure about the fact. Why? Because God has said so. He's promised to do so. 
So friends, this morning, can I suggest something to you? With the ways that God has blessed you and the ways that you respond to the Lord and give back to him, it's not so much a matter of duty as it is a matter of faith. Do you trust him enough this morning? Do you trust him? Do you really trust that God will do everything that he said he would do? Martin Luther, the one who many of us know as leading the the, the Reformation many years ago, Martin Luther once said the following. He said, I tried to keep all the things that I had in my hands, and as I did, I lost every single one. But what I have given to God, he said, I've noticed I still possess those things. He clearly trusted in God's promises. I want to ask us this morning, each one of us, to examine our lives and ask this simple question. Do the way that we manage the resources that God has given us, does it truly demonstrate that we truly trust God the same way that Martin Luther did? Well, What's the next thing that Jesus then tells us this morning about how we should be investing the resources that he's given us? Clearly, the first thing that he told us there is that we need to choose wisely. We need to make a good choice where we invest our resources. We need to invest in eternity, not in the earth. But can I also suggest there's something else he says in the following verse. He tells us there to not follow then the whims of our heart. To not follow the whims of our heart. And we see this as we take a look once again in the passage, Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. There he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. What's Christ getting at here? What's he trying to say? What do my eyes have to do with the resources in which I have been given? When Christ says that the eye is the lamp of the body, he's saying that it's the, if you will, the the channel through which we receive light. It's how we know that there is light because we see it. As light enters, it exposes everything within So the eye ultimately becomes an illustration of everything that we find deep within. It becomes an illustration of our heart. It becomes an illustration of our heart in a very real way. The the heart then is the eye of the soul. Through our hearts, we, we come to know God's truth. And when we do embrace it, we experience what? His love, his his joy, and his peace. When our hearts, our our spiritual eyes are clear. We know it tells us that our whole body then is full of light. On the other hand, if our eye is bad, preoccupied, if you will, by the things of this world, it's diseased and damaged by sin, it's very difficult for the light of Christ to enter in. So as a result, if our hearts have become overwhelmed by the selfish whims and desires that we find inside of us, We see then that darkness will overwhelm us, the darkness which we see in this world. And it will be hard to see anything of Christ because it's been crowded out by the things of this world. Therefore, to avoid such a fate, we have to daily be examining our heart, looking within, seeing what is the desires of my heart, examining, if you will, the eyes of my soul. The story is told of a mother who wanted to teach her young daughter a similar lesson. So she gave, going to church one morning, her daughter a quarter and a dollar bill. She said to her, put whichever one in the collection plate that you want to and keep the other. Well, later, after leaving church, she looked down at her little girl, and she wanted to have the similar conversation with her, and she said to her, she says, so what did you do? What, what, which one did you put in the collection plate? The little girl looked up at her mom, and she says, well, you know, I was going to give the dollar, but just before I was to do that, the man standing up on the stage says, God loves a cheerful giver. 
And I knew I'd be a lot more cheerful if I simply put in the quarter. <laughs> How often do we not respond in a really similar way? We're more concerned about our own ease, our own comfort, the things that we want. We want what we want without much concern for what God wants. On the other hand, when trials and difficulty come our way, is it any wonder then that God seems to be so far from us? Can I suggest it's not that he's abandoned us. He hasn't pulled away from us. Instead, it's that our hearts have embraced the things of this world and we have pulled away from him. That's why Christ told us to be wary of an unchecked heart, a heart that has not been held accountable, that is not seeking the things above. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, the things that come from a person's mouth come from the heart. And it's those things, those are the very things that defile a man, the things that come out of our heart. This is also why Solomon cautions each one of us, and he tells us very well that we need to check our heart. He says in Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So if your heart is clear, if it's seeking the things above, if it's seeking the things that glorify Christ, your eyes will be full of light. On the other hand, if we've embraced all the things of this world, and that's all that we want, if that's simply what we seek, then our hearts are going to be filled with the dark things of this world. So which is it? Is your eye clear? Can you see clearly? Can you see Christ and his will? Or is it simply about the things that you want when you want them? Well, let's move on now to the one last thing that Jesus tells us this morning. The one last thing that he tells us we need to do if we're going to invest wisely. We've seen that we have to choose wisely, and then we have to be careful. We've we got to guard our hearts. We've got to make sure that we're not seeking the things of this world. And ultimately, I believe he concludes with this simple admonition for each of us. He would simply tell each one of us, you've got to choose. You have a decision to make. You've got to make a wise choice. You know that you've got to invest wisely. You know that you can't follow the whims of your heart. But now, you've got to make a good choice. You must choose wisely. If you will, join me one last time, and let's look once again into the Scriptures. James chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, it describes for us what the heart that is full of darkness actually looks like. I want you to listen to James' description here. He says, what causes fights and, and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that are battling in you? You desire and you don't have, so you kill. You covet and you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive, notice this, because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own personal pleasures. It's clear, apart from Christ, the darkness that can overwhelm our heart from the things in this world can be very, very deep. It can result in fights and, and quarrels and, in, and, and in, even in the worst case scenario, maybe even murder. The reason we don't get what we want is because oftentimes our motives are impure. They're dark. We're driven by the desire for power and, and pleasure and applause and maybe even our sense of pride. Our hearts are lost in darkness, truly, truly lost, apart from the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Without him, without his work, we are truly hopeless. Even for those of us who know Christ, those who follow him, when we focus upon the earthly things that we see around us, above the things of Christ and the things of his kingdom, serving and making a difference in somebody else's life, when we focus upon those things, wouldn't you agree that when you get off track and you start living that way, does life get easier or does it get harder? It gets much harder, doesn't it? It gets much more difficult. I believe 
This pastor, his name is Peter Marshall. He pastors a church back in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. I believe he summarizes this principle really well in this following phrase. He said once, the trouble for many of us is that we spend what we haven't yet earned on things that we don't really need to impress people that we don't truly like. Instead, shouldn't we then be giving to God in accordance with how he's blessed us and according to, our, and according to the income that he's given us? Lest God make our income according to how we've been giving? You see, we give the way we give because we want what we want. But if we would give to God in proportion to the way that he has given to us and the way that he has blessed us, we would see him do amazing things in our lives. So to avoid such an outcome, I believe we have a decision to make. We see that decision in verse 24 of Matthew 6. Clearly, he says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. Friends, I can tell you from personal experience, and I say that sincerely, from personal experience, that that is absolutely 100% true. During that season, which I shared with you earlier, in my life in which I, I worked in the area of finance, I was advising people on how to invest. I tried to do just that. I tried to do both. I tried to work in business during the day and to fulfill my calling in ministry during the evening. It didn't work so well. It wasn't until I decided to fully commit everything in my life to Christ to give it all to him, to the work of ministry that which he called me to. It wasn't until then that I, got, that I began to see God do some really surprising and extraordinary things in my life. At that time, my way of thinking was like this. I had prepared for the ministry. I had been to Bible college. I had been to seminary. I had prepared. So I thought that I would serve in a typical American church full of American people. And, and I thought that I would marry an American girl and have a home full of American kiddos. That's what I thought. Clearly, God's plan, just a little different. He brought me halfway around the world to pastor a church full of people from the four corners of the globe. Boy, I love this. That's one of the most awesome things about being part of this fellowship, part of this church. In this congregation this morning, we probably literally have here this morning people from almost every continent of the globe. Just a small slice of heaven of what will be when we are in glory, and it's a wonderful thing to be part of. God brought me around the world to be part of a church like this. He brought me to Moldova to marry the daughter of a Moldovan pastor that I've grown to love and respect. And he brought me to Romania to fill my home with children that were desperate to find a mommy and daddy because they didn't have one. Are things a little different than I imagined? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 100% yes. But you know what? I wouldn't change it for all the money in the world. This has been a better blessing than anything I could have dreamed of. I've learned that God is faithful to his word. He does as he says. He keeps his promises when he says a little bit later in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Put him in his place. Seek him above all other things. Make him the priority. Seek that first. That he'll do as he said. All these things, everything that you have need of, all of it, will be given to you as well. I've learned it from personal experience, friends. I made my decision. Friends, I just got to love you and say, what decision will you make? What type of investment then? What type of investment for each of us then will give us the best return in our lives? Can I suggest to you this morning the type of investment that will give you the best return in your life, is it not clear? Is it not been easy to see this morning? Is it not clear that the investment that will give us the best return is an eternal one? 
where we invest in the savings accounts of heaven, where neither moth nor rust can come and destroy it, where thieves can't steal it, where nobody can get to it. It's there waiting in your investment account. It's there waiting in your savings account so that when you see the Lord, it's there waiting for you. The question is, will we trust him? Let me try one last time, if you will, to describe this for you. When you go to the doctor for a checkup, and I've got to do one of those here pretty soon. Some of you know I had a heart attack three years ago, and I've got to go see the doctor every six months, and my six-month checkup is coming up here pretty soon. I've got to go in for a tune-up. <laughs> got to go have my checkup done. When you go, doesn't this often happen? Doesn't the doctor begin to poke and, and prod and, and press in various places on our body? And while he does this, all the while he'll ask you the question simply, does this hurt? If we cry out in pain, it's clear that one or two things is real. One or two things is true. Either the doctor, without having too much, or without having the proper sensitivity, he pressed too hard, or maybe even more likely, there might actually be a problem. There might be something wrong. If something's wrong, doesn't the doctor often say, okay, we need to have some tests done. We need to figure out what the problem is because, you know what? It's not supposed to hurt there. So we need to figure out why it's hurting you. Friends, you know, it's similar. It's the reason why I don't talk about money very often. It's similar for the pastor. This is not something I like to talk about because I know it's uncomfortable. It's hard for each one of us. But it's really similar when the pastor preaches on financial responsibility. Because certain members will cry out in discomfort and in pain. They might even criticize the message and the messenger. In either case, maybe the pastor, he's pushed too hard. Maybe he's pressed in the wrong place. Maybe I didn't have the right sensitivity and that's caused a little bit of pain. But you know what? The reason that there might be pain, friends, the reason this morning that you might be feeling that twinge, that the Spirit of God might be saying something to you, is because there is something wrong. Maybe that's why you're feeling pain this morning. If that's the case, can I conclude with this statement? If there's something wrong, we need the great physician. We need the great physician to show up and bring healing and health spiritually to our lives. Why? It's not supposed to hurt there. There's not supposed to be pain there. And we need to find out why there is pain. Randy Alcorn, the author of the great little book on God and finance called The Treasure Principle, he summarizes this really well. He said the following, and I wanted to show you this. He who lays up treasures on earth spends his life backing away from his treasures. He spends his life backing away from the things that he thinks he values most. To him, when death comes, death truly is loss. It's gone. It's lost forever. On the other hand, he who lays up treasures in heaven looks forward to eternity. Why? Because he's moving daily every single day as he gets closer to eternity towards the treasures which he's invested in eternity. To him, death is, as Paul said, it is gain because it's all waiting for him. He who spends his life moving toward his treasures has reasons then to what? Rejoice. Rejoice. Not only am I going to be with my Savior for eternity, everything I've invested in eternity is waiting for me. I have reasons to rejoice. So the question I have for you today is simply, when you think of eternity, are you despairing? Or are you rejoicing, friend? Where are you? You see, it's essentially an issue of trust. Do you believe that God truly is faithful to his word? If you do, then can you have confidence that, any invest, that, that, that anything you invest in eternity, anything that you put in the hands of God, can you truly have confidence that it is secure, that God will do as he said, that it will be waiting for you? A bit later in the very same book, which 
the author wrote, Randy Alcorn wrote, he goes a bit further and he says this, and I'm going to conclude with this statement. He says, the more you give, the more that God will give back to you. Why? Because God is the greatest giver in all the universe. He won't let you outgive him. And then he says this, go ahead and try. Go ahead and try to outgive God. See what happens. So friends, this morning, I want to ask you, do you trust him enough to try? Do you trust him enough to say, God, I want to see if you are faithful? Do you trust God that way this morning? Will you do this by trusting him and seeing what he will do? You might have noticed we skipped something in the service. Now, I don't want you to be misunderstood, and I don't want you to get the wrong impression. This was not all about having a big offering. That's in God's hands. That's God's business. But this is a way for us to apply Scripture to our lives. See, it's not just about applying today or next Sunday or next month or next year. It's about saying, God, everything that I have has come from you. Every good gift has come down from the Father of lights. You've simply made me a steward of everything that you've put in my hands, and I'm giving it back to you. I'm entrusting it to you. So as we close this morning, I want to give us an opportunity today to trust God, to trust him with the resources he's given us. So if you will... I'd like for the ushers, if they can, to come this morning. If our ushers can join us up in the front. I want to ask you if you'll join me now as we pray, as we conclude our time in the scriptures, and as we ask the Lord to bless as we give. Lord, this morning we come before you and... In this most important area of our lives, Lord, you've given us a lot of information. It's clear in your word when you've written so much, you've revealed so much to us about the truth of being generous, of of giving without knowing, not, 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 not letting the right hand know what the left hand is doing, that we give, Lord, simply because you have given everything to us. And we want to honor you, Lord. We want to give back to you that which truly shows how much we love you. So, Lord, as we give now, we pray that you would be pleased with our gifts and that you would use them to bring glory to your name. God, I pray that there wouldn't be one person here today that would give out of a sense of duty. Lord, it's not a duty to give to you. It's a joyful opportunity to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me so much that you came to give your life for me. So bless our gifts, I pray. May we give to you out of hearts that say, I love you, Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name.